the 1968 men's track and field team at Washington State University was arguably the greatest collection of talent not only in school history, but maybe collegiate history as well. Paced by NCAA National Coach of the Year Jack Mubury and four NCAA champions that season, the Cougars came up one point shy of eventual national champion USC at the NCAA event, even though WSU had more national champions than any other school. The 39-member team featured 27 letter winners, six All-Americans, and posted a 6-2 record in dual meets, including a dominating 107-38 victory over Washington. At the 1968 NCAA Championships, Jerry Lindgren won both the 5,000 and 10,000 meter races, the first man in history to win both races in three straight NCAA championships. John Van Rienen captured the discus title and was runner-up in the shot put, while Captain Carl O'Donnell captured the national title in the javelin. Boyd Gittens finished second in the 400-meter hurdles, and Foss Miller, who was injured during the meet, finished sixth in the javelin. Additional competitors for Washington State during the 1968 championships included Art Sanderson, Rod Dahl, Bill Henry, Keith Deluge, Larry Olmberg, Barry Johnson, Jim Precht, Stu Hunnings, Rich Lapham, and Rick Riley. Throughout their collegiate careers, members of the 1968 team combined for an astounding 16 outdoor NCAA All-America certificates, three world records, two additional world best marks, eight American records, 11 collegiate records, and 10 conference titles. Tonight, the 1968 men's track and field team takes its place on top of the podium with its induction into the Washington State University Athletic Hall of Fame. Good evening. My name is Carl O'Donnell, and I was voted team captain by my teammates in 1968 and just realized eating tonight that the fact that we're not getting any younger, most of us are probably ready for a nap or close to bedtime. 1968 was a long time ago. I say, wow, we had a just a fabulous team and what a blessing it was to be on my part a part of that team and, and serve as their captain. We had athletes that were naturally talented and but also very dedicated, um, very hard working and, and intent on and committed to doing their best at all times. The thing I liked most about this team is the the type of individuals that made it up. They were very humble um, and yet very committed to to always serving the team as best they could. And this really held true at the national championships. The thing I regret about the team was during our track meets and, and like at the, at the nationals, um, we had all be competing in, in our you know, individual events and some people in more than one event. And, I, as a captain and, and, and just being me, I wanted to see all the events taking place, you know, as, as my friends competed and I wasn't able to do that. And that's the one thing I always regretted. I wanted to be able to sit back and watch everybody do their thing. Our loss to USC by one point was, you know, disappointing. Uh, there was probably, you can look back and say, there's a lot of ways that we, that we could have made up that one point. But it, that's, it was meant to be, and then that's the way it, that that's the way it was. And I think everybody on, on my team is very proud of the fact that they gave it their best, and um, it is what it is. I'd like to say a special thanks on behalf of my team uh, to Coach Mooberry, Jack Mooberry, and Coach Chaplin. Uh, for their dedication and, and support of this world-class team. Um, Coach Mulberry was a very special person. Uh, he was the type of person that could get the best out of you without saying really a whole lot. He was a very quiet person, very humble, um, almost like a father figure to some of us, especially as we came into school as freshmen. Um, he was there to support us in, in a lot more ways than just athletics. 
and I always appreciated that in him. They say opposites attract. I'm looking over here at Coach Chaplin. Coach Mooberry and Coach Chaplin were very much different. And Coach Chaplin, I would say, was more of a go-getter, you-can-do-it type of coach. I could always remember him saying over and over, you can do it, you can get this done. And he was very knowledgeable about a lot of different events and very capable as a coach, but he was also a really strong motivator and was right there behind us all the time. I sustained an injury when I was, I think it was in, late in my junior year, I was training in the field house with a friend of mine that was actually on the football team. And we were, we were doing laps just for conditioning and he was running behind me and accidentally tripped me. And I flipped over and landed on my left shoulder. Of course, I'm left on a javelin thrower. And I had a partial separation in my shoulder. And it took me really a long time to get over that and get back into condition to start throwing again in the spring. And it never really was the same after that accident. But Coach Chaplin pulled me aside one day in practice and he says, listen, he says, you got to start using your back more instead of relying on your arm because I always had a great arm. And he says, you got to start relying on your back more because you're you got that injury, and I was thinking to myself, boy, I think I got to use my whole body, you know. It's like, this is hard enough. And so anyway, in practice, I started, started putting more emphasis on using my back, and, and uh, I can remember it wasn't too long after that, I walked up to him, and he, it was getting close to going to Nationals, and I said, I think I can do this. I'm going to win it. And I think a lot of that was from his encouragement and his knowledge about, hey, you need to, you know, you need to use your back. My arrival at WSU as a freshman, um, and I know this is probably true for a lot of my teammates, um, I had the opportunity, having had the longest row in the nation in high school, um, to go to a lot of different schools. And I visited a lot of different schools. One of them was USC, and but when I came to WSU, um, the first thing that attracted me to the college was Coach Mugay. His personality, uh, the way that he approached me, uh, it was non-pressuring. Um, basically, you know, told me what the program, what was involved in the program, and 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 what I should expect. Um, the other thing that, that he gave me and the college also gave me, because I talked to more people than just him, was a homey feeling. And I'm kind of a homey kind of guy anyway. I was kind of a homebody, and I just felt a lot more comfortable uh, and just more relaxed after my visit to WSU. So I, I signed my letter of intent and, and ended up coming here. The other thing that attracted me to WSU was the field house. Um, as a javelin tour, there's not many places where you can practice, especially in Washington, um, or even Oregon, or schools you know, in the Northwest states that you got snow during the winter time, so you really can't train. But I knew I could train in the field house during the winter months. And that actually led to a, a a meet that I threw in inside the field house. It was early spring before we could get out on the track, and I ended up setting a world record in that for indoor uh, for indoor throwing of the javelin. And that was an interesting thing because it was 220 feet from where I threw to the base of the wall. And the wall at the end of the field house, if any of you are familiar with that, is just a big wooden wall, and up and up. On the upper floors was our weight room where we lifted weights, nothing like what they have now. And it was 220 feet from the scratch line to the base of the wall, and I stuck the javelin 45 feet up on the wall. <laughs> it's like, well, try to measure that one, you know. <laughs> anyway, they eventually had a math professor come down, and he did a triangulation on it, some 
really sophisticated thing. And he said, well, it's got to be a minimum of 250, and it's probably more than 275. And I thought, and even looking back now, I think that was probably the longest throw I ever threw in my career, but there was no way of actually measuring it. I'd like to thank Bill Moose and the committee uh, for selecting our team. Um, I'm biased, of course, but I think they made a good selection. This was really a, an all-world type team. We had great, great athletes, and it just all happened to come together in 1968. Um, I'd like to thank WSU for providing all of us with our athletic experience. And probably more importantly, the degrees that we obtained through WSU. I received a teaching degree, and that became uh, led to a lifetime career. And you know, the bottom line is, you know, I guess maybe more emphasis should be, should be put on athletes coming in. That you know, make the most of your scholarship. Um, not only do well in your athletics, but do something with the, the degree that you're going to receive because it's going to last the rest of your life. I couldn't have gone, I couldn't have gone to WSU or any of the other colleges I visited because of my parents' situation without a scholarship. And so I'll, I'll forever be thankful and grateful for that. I'd like to thank uh, Bridget Slaybaugh for her efforts in putting this together. I know that she just recently got married and it was probably a pretty tight timeline making this all come together. Uh, before I finish, I wanted to mention that uh, joining me tonight is my special wife, Nancy, my daughter, Carrie, who's going to Eastern Washington University and finishing up this year. And she was a great volleyball player until she blew out her knee and my sister-in-law, Carol Christofferson. And my other daughter, that's going to Wenatchee Valley College her second year, is playing in a volleyball match tonight and couldn't be here, so go Knights. <laughs> my most memorable, memorable experience, I guess, at WSU and in, in, the, in, in our meets was, of course, winning the Nationals. But it's how it came about that made it a forever memory for me. I was leading in the preliminaries, and so I got to go last in the finals. And it came down to the guy before me, uh, he was from somewhere in California, Palo Alto, I think, and he threw, he threw 252 something and beat my mark. And so I had one throw left, and Little did I know it, when well, I got back to the end of my run-up um, spot, which is about 105 feet, and it overlapped with the high jump runway. And John Fosbury was back there, and he was getting ready to take his last jump, and he had to clear the height that he was trying to clear to win the Nationals. So it was a pretty, pretty critical moment. But I don't, I don't know if anybody here knows John Fosbury, but he was a really funny, goofy guy. And he looked at me and he goes, well, who's going to go first? And I said, well, I'll go first. And so I, I set up and took off down the runway and threw far enough to win and jumping up and down. And I came back and about two minutes later, he was ready to go down his runway and up and over he went and he won the Nationals. So that was a really, really special time for me. And people at that time, you know, were thinking John Fosbury with the Fosbury flop, they didn't even know if it was legal. You know, they were, everybody was questioned with it. Now everybody in the world does the Fosbury flop, you know. I had one other really funny experience um, growing up as far as athletics, and it's something I'll never forget. In, in uh, junior high, we had the softball throw. And of course, I always had a good arm, so they figured I ought to be throwing something. And, um, that year, um, I set a national record in a softball throw of 320 feet. So I 
before I really became known as a you know long thrower in softball, I went to this meet and there was about 15 schools there. It was a really really big track meet, and I went out on the field and and uh, got ready to warm up. And I I looked at where the scratch line was and it was on the 40 yard line, because most of the throwers in my age group were throwing 100 to 150 feet. And I, I looked at the referee and I said, you know, I didn't want to upset him or anything. I'm pretty humble about it. I said, I don't think this is going to work. And he looked at me like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, see those houses out on the other side of the track, outside the stadium? I said, that's where I'm going to throw the softball. And he looked at me like, yeah, right, kid. <laughs> and he said, he said, I think this is going to work just fine. He was kind of stubborn a little bit, you know, and kind of knew what he was doing. And so I didn't say anything. And I, so I went back and got ready to throw when, I, when it was my turn and heaved the softball. And it went clear out of the stadium, hit the top of the roofs, and bounced all over like a pinball and fell down between the houses. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And I said, well, try to measure that one. <laughs> He says, I think we'll move the scratch line back. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for everybody coming tonight. And, and this is a very enjoyable time and experience. And we'll Cougs tomorrow against Nevada. Thank you. I, I'd like the rest of the guys that were on the 68 team here to stand up, guys. So. Washington State has always had good track teams, back with Doc Bowler, Carl Slaterman, Jack Moody, Newberry, and, and I, I happen to be just following what they did. But the point is, that team in 1960, first it was the first team I've been at Washington State since I came back. I came back in January of 1968. I've been assistant coach at Oregon State. And to have, to, you have to understand, to have people that wrote Three, three members on the team held world records. Not the American record, not the Washington State record, but the world record. Now, I've been coaching for a long, long time. There's not been a single team in the history of the NCAA since then that has had three world records on the same team. So I'd like to give, you, give these guys a great hand again. They're great Cougars.